Yesterday, I spoke about Jesus as our high priest. If there is a central theme of this amazing sermon, that's it. And if there's one verse that the whole sermon uh, expounds, applies, meditates on, wants to give us a vision of, it's the word of God to his Messiah, the great high priest. When God, uh, from Psalm 110, verse 4, the Lord has sworn and he will not repent, he won't change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, four things here. You, who is the you? Jesus. Uh, are a priest. What kind of priest? With what kind of service? In what kind of place? Uh, after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, who was both priest and king. You have here a new order of priesthood, uh, which is royal priesthood. Remember yesterday we went back just very briefly to Exodus chapter 19, where God uh, tells Moses to tell the people what he proposes, the, the, the mission, the vocation that he proposes for the people that he delivered out of Egypt. Uh, the mission that he will equip them for by the covenant that he makes with them at Mount Sinai. Uh, and he says, you are my treasured private property possess possession. And you will be for me a holy nation and a royal priesthood. Mixing what otherwise is separated in the Old Testament. Holy nation. Not a political nation, but a holy nation. So Israel's basic uh, uh, vocation is liturgical. Can I repeat? Israel's vocation is liturgical service of God, not primarily political service of God. So it's a country with a difference. And they are a, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. Now notice the emphasis is not on their royalty, but on their priesthood. A priestly people. Um, uh, everything is sort of turned on its head. Here you have a whole people that it has a priestly mission. Uh, a whole people that has access to God. A people who is holy, uh, a people who has a mission to mediate God's holiness to all the people of the world. God has called them from the nations of the world to be a priestly, uh, no, a royal priesthood with his people. Yes, they are to reign with God, but they reign with God liturgically. Um, it, just out of interest, and since Reed is here, I'll throw this in. Uh, uh, my take on the whole of the book of Isaiah is that Isaiah wants to lead the people of Israel away from the fantasy about themselves as the um, uh, Jerusalem, as the capital city of a world empire with their king as a world emperor and the function of Israel as the ruling class within a world empire. Lead them away from a political uh, vision of their mission for God to a liturgical vision of God. Uh, the key vision in Isaiah chapter 4 is of Jerusalem as a shrine as a place of worship for all the nations of the earth. That is the vocation of Israel. Um, I've spoken then uh, about 
Jesus, the vision of Jesus is our high priest, but uh, 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 he is high priest for us. And we are involved in his high priesthood. And that's what I want to look at first of all this morning. And uh, we will be dealing with that for the rest of the course in various ways in the passage we, we look at. Um, the passage I read to you from chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, Hebrews says, therefore, therefore there, wherever you see a therefore, ask what it's there for. Uh, what has he said previously? We've had another therefore, and we've got to go back further. Since therefore, <laughs> it's a chain of therefores, so we go back a bit further. Okay, uh, we go back to 10. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder or pioneer, uh, the beginner of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies Jesus and those who are sanctified are one source. Going to verse 14, since therefore children share in flesh and blood, he himself partook of the same things uh, shared the same things, and that's in double sense, not only partook of it, this is metecho, he shared of the same things, and he shared the same things. A pun there. Uh, he shared the same things, uh, partaking of it, and he shares the same things with us. That through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Verse 17. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation, that's too narrow, to atone the sins of the people. To atone the sins of the people, uh, he becomes high priest first and then he atones. So his work of atonement, speaking about here, is what he's doing now, not just his sacrificial death. Can you see it's present tense? Um, and then you get the next therefore. Therefore, so since Jesus is this high priest who shares our flesh and blood, who uh, uh, destroys, disarms the devil. Therefore now, holy brothers. We are not just holy brothers with each other. We're not just brothers with each other in the same family, but we are brothers of Jesus. We share in his holiness and uh, uh, we are part of his priestly brotherhood, his priestly fraternity. You remember from the Old Testament, the, the priests regarded themselves as a brotherhood, as a fraternity. We are part of the priestly fraternity of Jesus. He is our big, big brother. We are brothers together with him. And we are holy. We share in his holiness. Holy <laughs> brothers who share in a heavenly calling, we share in Jesus heavenly calling. What's Jesus heavenly calling? He's high priest. And we share in that heavenly calling. Uh, we are not just holy like the angels. We don't just have angelic status. Uh, we are not uh, uh, just holy as priests. But we, uh, like the priests of the Old Testament, or the high priest, but we share in the high priesthood of Jesus, the most holy high priest. So we have a heavenly calling. We have two callings, two callings. Each of us has a separate earthly calling. And uh, you know our Lutheran theology well enough to know that we have uh, our earthly calling in our station and vocation. So. I have a calling in my family, I have a calling in society, I have a calling in the church. And the calling in the church is a holy calling. And likewise, uh, uh, as a holy person, 
I have holy work to do in my family and in the world. Uh, but overriding these various vocations that you and I have is our common heavenly vocation, the vocation that we share together with Jesus, our vocation as a royal priesthood. That's not good enough. Hebrews doesn't talk about the priesthood of the faithful. In fact, he doesn't talk about our priesthood at all because the important thing isn't us as priests. The important thing is Jesus the high priest and we sharing the same calling as his. If you wanted to put it in uh, 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 biblical terms, then we have a high priestly calling as the uh, holy brothers of Jesus, the high priest, and as part of his priestly fraternity. If you go to chapter 13, verse 1, which is the final uh, admonitions, uh, uh, the author of Hebrews says, let brotherly love continue. That's too weak. Let brotherly love remain and remain forever. Let brotherly love remain. And he's not talking about the brotherhood of man in a typical liberal sense or social sense or political sense. He's talking about in a heavenly sense. We, have a, we are part of this heavenly brotherhood, the heavenly calling that we have together with Jesus, the high priest. Now, as you know, you are, we've done enough uh, about that for you to be able to understand that. Uh, it means basically what? It means that we go where no high priest in the Old Covenant ever went. And we can go there at any time, any place, uh, personally, in prayer. And we as a, uh, but that's not the primary uh, uh, dimension of our high priestly status. We don't go alone uh, the way the high priest used to go alone into that uh, frightening wonderful, terrible place, the Holy of Holies, but we go there communally. Notice the admonition here is communal, congregational. We, all of us, uh, every single member of the congregation, uh, uh, new Christians, old Christians, babies through to uh, uh, comatose uh, people, bedridden people who are suffering from Alzheimer's, all of us have a high priestly heavenly calling. Isn't that great? Isn't that an immense privilege? And uh, we exercise that vocation uh, most clearly, if you like, you can put it in two ways, and this is not new, uh, but most clearly we exercise that vocation together with Jesus when we pray, not for our ourselves, but we pray for others. Just as he, Jesus exercises his high priestly vocation, um, most fundamentally by interceding for us and every single human being, so we exercise our hope, high priestly vocation most clearly in intercessory prayer. Uh, so we are holy brothers together with Jesus in a high priestly fraternity brotherhood uh, with Jesus, our big brother. Uh, we share in his holiness. A little bit more of that later. Secondly, uh, uh, Hebrews says that we are the house of God. Um, chapter 3, verse 5 uh, and 6. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were spoken later. That's about numbers. You're referring to that passage where you have the uh, uh, grumbling of Miriam and Aaron because Moses is up himself and thinks himself better and they, God spoken to them, so they are just as holy as Moses. Um, and it was in that uh, uh, section of the Old Testament uh, that uh, uh, we read that Moses was faithful 
He was a faithful steward in the house of God. Now, what's the house of God? Now, Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant. Um, servant is too bland. Is as a, as a steward, as a um, um, yeah, steward's probably the best to testify to the things that would be spoken later. So the work of Moses in the house of God uh, points to the things that are spoken later, which is the new covenant. But Christ is faithful over God's house as son. So uh, Moses was faithful in God's house Jesus is faithful not only in God's house, but over God's house. Notice this is going further than Moses. Jesus out Moses is Moses. And then what's God's house? We are God's house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence, our freedom of speech, and our boasting in our hope. Our boasting in what we hope for and what we already have. So what's God's house? In typical fashion, Hebrews is punning. Uh, now, you know punning okay? uh, is playing on words and the meaning of words and the double senses of God's words. Uh, I mean, not God's words, uh, uh, words. Um, uh, uh, it's what you do in poetry. It's what you do when you make jokes. Uh, all, all good jokes, in a sense, uh, hinge around puns, playing with words, the witty jokes. Okay? Here you get a pun, a play on words. What is God's house? It's God's household, his family. Uh, uh, so, household family. So, uh, we are God's family. And not just family in a general sense. If God is the monarch, and Jesus is the co-regent with God and we are members of God's family what kind of a family do we live in royal family we have royal status we have a royal mission we have a royal identity uh, uh, we share in the glory of God we share in the glory of Jesus the status of Jesus, the, uh, uh, the status that he has as the uh, co-regent with God the Father, the status that Jesus has as Christ. So we are, to use Luther's memorable term, little Christ. He is the anointed one, the anointed king par excellence, and we are little Christ together with him. Royal status as part of the royal family. But house, as you know from the Old Testament, is the term for the temple. I don't know whether you realize that the temple in Jerusalem is hardly ever called the temple. It's always called what? House. The house of God. Now, uh, so we are both family and temple. Uh, where is it that God lives? Where is God's residence? Once again, it's uh, bifocal. Remember how much I've been talking about the bifocal vision of Hebrews? Uh, no, uh, where are we when we gather for worship? On earth and in heaven. Uh, what, what's, the, what's the service that we're involved in? Heavenly and earthly. That bifocal vision. Now this is another case of bifocal vision. Uh, God's temple is in, God's house is in heaven. But then, where is his house on earth? Not a building. Every single congregation is the house of God. His holy temple. So, um, uh, when was it? On, on, on Monday, was it? We had the reading from Habakkuk. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Now, a, a, a Hebrews reading of that says, which temple? Yes, yes. right? Can you see uh, um, the way Hebrews works? Uh, bifocal vision. We have been talking about a vision, bifocal. It's not one 
but it's this two, uh, uh, two-dimensional vision, bifocal. Um, now, uh, as those who are uh, holy priests, we are partakers or companions or sharers in Christ. And that takes up the point that I've uh, uh, just made. So Christ, remember, is a title. Christ means what? Anointed, anointed king and anointed priest. priest. Not two separate things. At the one and the same time, he is priest and king. He has this double office uh, that he exercises. And if we are metechoi, notice the, uh, uh, we're speaking about how the way Hebrews loves the echo uh, verbs, the have verbs. Uh, pay close attention, by the way, is parecho, uh, uh, um, and so on. Uh, uh, met echo. Okay, echo means what? To have. And then you have met echo. Echo have, meta is with or together with. To have together with uh, some. Uh, uh, co-owning, co-possessing. So uh, here we get a pun again. Hebrews loves, loves puns. Uh, and and uh, it's not just because he's witty uh, and clever. Uh, some intellectuals just love punning just for the sake of punning, but their puns are so obscure uh, that uh, own, uh, they're showing off of how clever they are. Uh, the punning of Hebrews is to give us bifocal vision, that two-dimensional vision or the full-dimensional vision. So if we are metakoi, uh, to Christu, literally, um, uh, 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 sharers in common of Christ, it, it, it's to be taken in two sense. What do all of us have in common here? Christ. That's the only thing that you and I have in common, really. We all have Christ. Uh, Christ, priest and king. But then it can be taken in the second sense. Since we all have Christ in common, we all share in the same work as Christ, the mission of Christ, the vocation of Christ. So we have Christ in common and we are called then in our vocation to uh, be partners with the Messiah, with, uh, uh, with Jesus the Messiah, with Jesus the High Priest. So, uh, 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 metechoi is both partner with and a participant in. You with it? So, can you see the pun? It's participant uh, in Christ. We have Christ in common. And because we have Christ in common, we are partners together with Jesus. Partners with Jesus, uh, the great high priest. Um, the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are of one source. Ex henos. One source is not right. Uh, from one and the same person. Uh, so we have a common origin. Uh, what's the common origin of Jesus and us? Here we get a pun again. Both Jesus and us are common descendants of Adam. We are common descendants of, by grace, we are common descendants of Abraham. Uh, we are, uh, but we also are common sons of God. We both have God the Father as our Father. So, uh, since we are united with Jesus, we are one with him, uh, his father becomes our father. Uh, so it's translated in the ESV, uh, of one source. Now that makes it impersonal. Um, you know, we, have, we come from some common thing. But the common is a person, 
Most obviously, it is that we are uh, uh, both descendants of Adam and we have, uh, uh, we have a common sonship, uh, which is uh, that we are from God the Father. Uh, Jesus is the one who sanctifies us. Notice the present tense in 2.10, the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are of one person, are from one person. Um, uh, we share in the holiness of God. Uh, we are sanctified by Jesus. And that means that we are hagioi, saints, holy ones. Um, if you read the New Testament, uh, 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 Christians are seldom called Christians. It's in two places uh, that we find the term, the, the, the adjective Christian used for disciples of Jesus. Do you know what the commonest term is for uh, Christians? Saints. That's the second one. Followers? Hmm? Followers, not very common. That's that way down. Brothers. Brothers. Brothers, number one. Disciples is followers, that's down. The second commonest term, which would have been most offensive for any Jew, is we're all saints. Holy ones. Saints. Uh, for uh, contemporary Jews in the time of Jesus and Paul, uh, if you spoke about the hagioi, the holy ones, immediately people would say, oh yes, yes, I know what you're talking about. Do you know the way it would be taken? Angels. Not priests, although that could be possible. Um, uh, but the primary reference is to angels. So uh, we have uh, angelic status. Now, the angels are holy because they live in the presence of the holy God, and so they share fully in God's holiness. They are therefore the hagioi, the holy ones. You get an Old Testament, uh, that becomes stronger and stronger in intertestamental Judaism, and so it becomes almost a technical term for the angel. The, uh, you know, the Lord will come with his holy ones. Uh, the primary reference there is angels. Uh, so angels. We have angelic status, but it's even better than that. Because who is the Holy One of God? Jesus. So we share the same status of, as Jesus. We are hagioi, saints. And you don't have to die and wait until the Pope <laughs> makes his declaration to become a saint. We are living saints here and now. And uh, 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 notice too, and I keep on hammering this, we see this individually. You know, I'm a saint, but the New Testament always uses it plural term. Holy ones, holy people, holy community, in community, in the church. Uh, uh, you have uh, uh, holy. So we confess, uh, we believe in the communion of saints. saints. Now that has so many levels of reference, so it is the communion of saints is all God's holy people, but it also means the holy angels. And it's also you uh, uh, in the sense of a communion uh, that comes from a common participation in the holy things. So koinonia hagion, uh, communio sanctorum in Latin is uh, the communion of holy people uh, through participation in the holy things. Uh, so, holy uh, people. Doesn't, yes? Doesn't no, just back there, right, please. Apart from, we are really not recognized as individuals That's because right. apart from Christ and that community, we really don't have an identity. Yeah, um, yeah uh, it's... Uh, 
sadly, the, the other people uh, understand uh, our nature better than we do. We've been so riddled by modern, the philosophy, the false ideology of uh, individualism. The idea that, that, that is foundational to Western society and put, uh, since the Enlightenment, and that's foundational to the USA, is that we exist primarily as individuals. Um, I try to avoid the use individual totally because it is false. Nobody is an individual. We are persons, but not individuals. Individual means separate unities, and we are whole and complete in ourselves. Uh, it was a, uh, uh, a Marxist poet called Bertolt Brecht who said, we live, we are conceived in community, we live in community, and we die in community, and we are never by ourselves. Now, now this is speaking in <coughs> secular terms. Uh, our existence is corporate, is communal. Uh, that applies supremely for us as Christians. Uh, we're not just born, we're con no, if you think in conception, it takes two people to conceive a child, at least it used to. Uh, two people to conceive a child. So you are born, you are conceived in a community of two people. You are born in the community of two people. You're born into a family, into a, a community, into a nation, into the family of man. So we are always community. And our very existence and identity is in community. Um, and we, uh, 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 our whole life is in community. Now, uh, as Christians in baptism, uh, we aren't brought into a private, personal relationship with Jesus. Watch out for that kind of talk, which is uh, uh, rife here in uh, 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 ev evangelical circles. Now, my uh, uh, personal relationship with Jesus very often means my private uh, uh, connection with Jesus. Um, now, J there's Jesus and me, and we have our little love affair, uh, and nobody else intrudes on that. Rubbish. Uh, when you uh, uh, become a Christian, when you're baptized, yes, you are united with Christ, but at the same time, you're brought into a community. You can't have Jesus as your Lord and Savior without having his church at the same time. Um, just as I can't have my brother without the rest of my family. I can't have my wife as my wife without also having her family. Uh, uh, Christians are, are supremely uh, are, are conceived in community, are born again in community, uh, live in community, work in community, have everything in community, and die in community, and will uh, uh, forever exist in community. Now, um, uh, the Christians in the third world uh, uh, their great, one of their great contributions to us Westerners is this communal uh, vision of life. Uh, uh, God's judgment's coming on our individualism in the West, uh, and we better learn it, otherwise things will get, go from uh, worse to even worse, uh, unless we heed God's judgment for our idolatry and stupidity in thinking that we are self-sufficient, individual, isolated entities who choose to enter into relationship with other. How important decision is. You, know, you decide to get married, you decide to make friends, uh, you contract with other people as you choose. Uh, uh, that's a false, fake vision of life, community. Yes, somebody had a hand up. Right. Yes. Focus on what we talked about yesterday about the actions of people defining the land. Yes. That we are alone, that we are community. 
Yes, and the community is broader than just hu human beings. Genesis 2 said, uh, uh, Genesis 1 says uh, that we were made on the sixth day, uh, and we weren't made as individuals, but we were made male and female together. Uh, and male and female together bear the image of God, but we were made on the same day as the animals. So we are in community with the animals in some sense, uh, but also in community with all living creatures. That's the uh, truth, if you like, of the and the importance of the whole ecological movement is to rediscover our communal identity, uh, not just as human beings in the order of creation, but with uh, all God's creatures. Yes. Now, you, you talk about the Western thinking. Um, you know, even the Constitution says we the people in order to form a more perfect union. Yes. You can't form a union with one person. That's right. Um, so I think there is the danger. Well, libertarianism, I think, is probably more accurate to say <coughs> strong individualism comes from that idea. Yes. And also the French Revolution. The French Revolution, yes. It's, it, look, it's not just one source. Uh, uh, this is not due because it's the old idolatry. Yeah. Because uh, uh, the supreme idol is Trinitarian, consisting of I, me, and myself, <laughs> the unholy trinity. And that's been the whole problem of sin, is that we imagine that we are gods and that we are self-sufficient. Uh, so it's, it's as old as sin, and you can't just pin any one society or any one movement in human history. Uh, yes, uh, one of the astonishing things about um, uh, uh, the history of America, if I, I don't know as well as you do, uh, but is its communal nature right from the beginning. Uh, say, we the people uh, 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 is thinking, you know, their uh, beef, if you like, against the British was that uh, 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 they didn't treat them communally. Right. Uh, if you could put it that way. In the Declaration. And so the Declaration of Independence uh, uh, recognizes uh, the people of the USA as a community. Uh, uh, the great uh, French philosopher, sociologist, observer who visited the USA very early in the early 1800s uh, expected to find a society resembling what he, he hoped that he'd find the society that the French Revolution failed to create. Uh, de Tocqueville. And what did he find? A society whose strength was community. And people live at every level living in community. And, and that not just politically, but the strength of the family, the strength of our, our local community. He was particularly astonished at local communities and the way they worked and how this was the strength of the country. And so he uh, spoke about civic institutions mediating between the uh, uh, family and uh, the political domain. Uh, the resources, I'm, I'm going beyond Hebrews now. Uh, and I better stop. Uh, but you've <laughs> provoked me. <laughs> uh, uh, it's there in your political DNA, and there's no reason why it can't be reclaimed. Uh, but uh, one of the problems, and this is the final thing I'm going to say about that, is the whole accursed Bill of Rights. Because that, instead of that being understood communally, it's been interpreted individually. Uh, okay, but that's another story. Okay, uh, uh, saints, holy community. Now, we can't fix up the society. That's not our business. We are called to be a holy community. And that's not w vague, waffly stuff, but that's congregational stuff, warts and whiskers and all. Um, uh, uh, e, uh, we are a holy priesthood or holy high priestly people who share God's holiness by virtue of our access to the most ho ho 
the most holy heavenly sanctuary, uh, our heavenly calling and status has to do uh, with our access to heaven itself, um, the heavenly holy places. We have access to God the Father through Jesus, together with Jesus, uh, so that we can offer our prayers and our praises together with Jesus to God the Father. We have access there. And that means quite concretely that uh, since we have access to God's holiness and his holy presence, we have access to God's grace and mercy. And that is not just for ourselves. That is for others. Other people in the church, other people in the world. So you see our, from a human point of view, what part of the liturgy shows us most clearly our heavenly calling, our high priestly vocation. And you always got to think, you know, if you do, my axiom is uh, right theology is pastoral and it is liturgical. Okay, I've been talking about some of the pastoral application of this, liturgical application. What, in what part of the liturgy do we congregationally most clearly exercise our high priestly holy calling? The prayer of the church. The prayer of the church. And that's coupled with the offerings. And the offerings which are not for, meant primarily for ourselves, but for the whole church and people in need. Did you hear what I said? Mm -hmm. uh, not just local congregation, yes it is that, not just to support pastor church workers, but the whole church, the whole people of God. Let us uh, pray for the people of God and all people according to the needs. Let us present our offerings for who? The whole church, the people of God and all people for needs. You could introduce that. Uh, now, uh, one of the signs of uh, 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 that's uh, uh, of spiritual sickness. I'm better use words carefully because I don't want to uh, stand in judgment. Uh, one of the signs of spiritual sickness in my church and your church and Western <coughs> churches around the world is that congregations basically are giving to themselves. And in your terms, not to synod and not to, uh, not just to your own, but to mission. Not giving to, and uh, not giving very much to people in need. A healthy church spiritually, a holy church is a giving church. A church that's rich in deeds of mercy and in gifts of mercy. And gifts of mercy to people in need locally but also internationally uh, gifts of mercy to other churches and the mission of the church uh, sadly this is happening and it's happening on an individual basis uh, one of the great things that your church has been doing there's been a revival of mission uh, in the new opportunities and that's fantastic uh, there's a window of opportunity at the moment that you need to seize as a church but what do people have to do who want to do mission work overseas? Uh, raise money and it's fundraising. Yep. Yes. Fundraising. What they want is secular money, common money, rather than holy money. How does mammon, unholy ma uh, mammon, become holy mammon? On the altar. Prayer On the altar. It is sanctified by the prayer of God, uh, uh, I mean, by, by the word of God and prayer. Uh, I beseech you, brothers and sisters, uh, 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 like people in Australia, we are very, very wealthy. Uh, but we need, as a holy priestly people, uh, to give our, of our resources, our surplus wealth, to other churches, uh, to mission, to people in need, wherever we see their needs around the world. 
That's our priestly vocation. You see it in part nine of Luther's small catechism. You remember the table of duties? What's our service according to our holy calling? Our holy callings? It's not table of duties, wrong term. This is priestly service uh, in our holy callings. It ends in a very interesting way uh, with two little scriptural passages. Do you remember how it ends? And it's interestingly, uh, quite often, uh, this is the part of the catechism is most unfashionable and is seldom taught and seldom preached on. And if ever there's a time that we need to preach on it, it's now. How does it end? Prayers and intercessions. For all people. So uh, what's our, we have our individual vocations according to our station and our, our situation in the holy orders, but what do we have all in common as a community is that we are called, this is 1 Timothy chapter 2, are called to pray for everyone and particularly people in government. Um, that we pray for all people according to their needs uh, in four different kinds of prayers and we are to pray for government uh, and the world as a whole. Uh, that's number one and then what's the second uh, uh, little scriptural verse that comes at the end of it? You had it right. The command to Love the neighbour. Love your neighbour. And that's not... Uh, this, this, yes, Romans 3. Uh, uh, the command to love your neighbour, uh, and I don't need to uh, 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 unpack that for you. You know who the neighbour is uh, as well as I do. But loving the neighbour, showing love to the neighbour, and the neighbour not only within your own uh, family and own congregation, but the neighbour according to the, uh, the person who is in need. Loving your neighbour, and that's not a command to feel love towards somebody, but it's a command to do the action, um, uh, to do deeds of mercy and to give gifts of mercy. That's our common high priestly vocation. Uh, but the deeds of mercy uh, uh, coming out of Hebrews and elsewhere in the New Testament need to be, the gifts that we bring need to be consecrated by the word of God and prayer. Like all God's offerings, they are common things brought to God and by being brought to God they cease to be common things, they become holy things. And they then are means not just of earthly blessing, but they are means of heavenly blessing. They bring heavenly blessing to the people who receive these uh, uh, gifts from the church. Right, right here ends my little rant. <laughs> um, right, uh, our service as holy people, as a high priestly community is not a matter of law as in the Old Testament but it is by grace. Uh, can we go uh, to two passages um, chapter 9 verse 14 what are we all called to do? Um, we need to have verse 13 and 14 could somebody please read that for me? Hebrews 9 13 14. Okay. Yeah good. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of an effort sprinkling those who had been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Right, what's uh, uh, the purpose of Christ, the high priest, uh, work with us, both his uh, 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 service as high priest and his service as our victim, the one who sacrifices himself, Jesus the priest and Jesus the sacrifice. The purpose of that is to cleanse our consciences. For what purpose? To serve the living God. 
Now, you don't get the serve, serve there is not uh, uh, do lo'o, um, no, become slaves, workers for God, but it's latroio, uh, which is to do divine service, worship. Uh, so uh, we are called to serve, um, to do divine service to the living God. Um, and you know how that happens. We are called to serve the living God in our worship of the living God. Second passage which likewise has to do with divine service. And both of these are summary passages drawing together uh, an argument uh, most supremely. And this is uh, a verse, chapter 12, verse 16, is, if you like, uh, uh, the uh, end of the theological exp uh, 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 exposition. And then you get admonitions coming after that. This is the culmination of the theological uh, exposition. Um, now, uh, I won't read from any, does any, would anybody happen to have a authorized version on them or a uh, new authorized uh, King James version? No, you don't have it? Okay, I'll give you a literal translation. No, no, don't, don't, don't worry, it's a waste of time. Um, therefore, receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, receiving a kingdom, um, receiving kingship that cannot be shaken, uh, this is, uh, remember, royal people, we are sons of the heavenly king, uh, receiving uh, kingship, a role of uh, 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 kingship that can't be shaken, which means eternal kingship in an eternal kingdom, the kingdom of God, receiving it. Now notice the uh, uh, receptive there. We receive the kingdom. We don't make the kingdom come. We receive the kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us have grace. Let us have grace by which we offer a pleasing service to God with reverence and awe. God pleasing service. What kind of service, what kind of worship is God pleased with? The service which is not of the law but service of grace. Having Having received grace and continuing to receive God's grace, uh, we then offer service. Now, here's another pun of Hebrews. Uh, we receive, we have charis. Charis. So, notice the verb have again, echo, charis. Charis means first and foremost grace, but it can also have a secondary sense of, do you know what it is, those of you Hebrew buffs? Charis or grace, gift, yeah, that's still the same sense. Grace, gift, favour, charity. charity, all those, that's still basically the same thing. But Charis itself, no, no, gratitude, thanksgiving. To give charis to God means to give thanks to God. Gratitude. Uh, gratitude is, is, not str is, is too inward. It's, it's too much of an attitude, although it involves that. It's thanksgiving. Take this element of grace as gift. If you receive a gift, what's the appropriate response? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. So the New Testament puns, and picky Paul puns all the time, about the connection between charis, God's grace, God's favour, God's gifts, and our oikaristia. Oikaristia, Thanksgiving. So grace, Thanksgiving belongs together. Uh, we receive the grace of God most tangibly, most obviously, when we receive the body and blood of Jesus in the Lord's Supper. But we do so, how? With faith and 
thanksgiving. So the Lord's Supper already uh, in the New Testament it begins, but then in the early church going through uh, uh, Christendom and even in our confessions is called the Eucharist, the thanksgiving. So uh, uh, as holy people, we are, uh, perform divine service, the divine service together with Jesus, together with the angels, together with the whole communion of saints here on earth and in heaven, the church militant, the church triumphant, one service, one people, all receiving the same grace of God, the same mercy of God, the same charis of God, the same gift of God, and that then issues in common thanksgiving. Uh, now, uh, uh, if you know our Lutheran confessions, uh, you know that in the Apology, Melanchthon makes a distinction between two kinds of latria, two forms of divine service. Uh, he distinguishes it, but he doesn't separate them from each other. There's the service of the Old Covenant, which is the service which is governed basically by law. So he talks about the service of the law. And then in contrast with that, he comes to the new covenant, which is the service of the gospel, the service of grace, the service of grace, uh, the New Testament service, which has to do with receiving the heavenly gifts of God for our life here on earth. So what is our common heavenly vocation? To our uh, 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 serve together with Jesus to perform the divine service together with Jesus and the whole communion of saints including the angels in the heavenly sanctuary but already here now on earth it's all one package uh, and we do so by grace now what does that mean quite concretely we don't generate this out of ourselves we don't create it, we don't invent it, uh, uh, we don't depend on our own resources from it. In the divine service, everything that we have, we have as a gift from God. We receive everything from God as a gift and we use these gifts then to do what God wants us to do. Okay, heavenly calling, heavenly service, holy people, high priestly people, our heavenly vocation. Uh, vision, bifocal vision. Uh, bifocal vision. It looks on the one hand as if everything depends on us, but what's the reality? Everything depends on Jesus. Uh, it looks as if it is done by a tiny little struggling community here on earth. That's the way it looks, and that's real. Uh, but what's the full picture? It's part of a huge assembly, a huge congregation in heaven and all around the earth. It looks as if we're doing it here, say, in Fort Wayne, and that's true. But it's also at one and the same time in heaven. It looks as if we are doing it alone. And that's what the devils will try to do. He will try to isolate people, divide community. So particularly as pastors, what's the, uh, one of the biggest problems that we have as pastors is loneliness. You've all experienced that. I don't have to tell you that. And even if you have a co-pastor or shared ministry, sometimes you can be most lonely in a shared pastorate. Um, uh, loneliness. And it's not just you. Uh, all your members will be feeling, and with the pressure of society, increasingly lonely and isolated. That's what it looks like. Um, we may feel lonely, but are we ever alone? No. Uh, that's the fuller picture that we need to have uh, in order to be able to serve 
as pastors and lay people with joy and gladness uh, in order not to lose heart and to drift away and fall away from the service of the living God. Let's have a break.